This is Andrew Wallach, and today I'm going to begin a series talking about a subject that has transformed my life, and that's the topic of righteousness. And you know the term righteousness has lost its meaning to a lot of people today. They don't, uh, it's a cliche, it's a religious cliche, it really doesn't impact their daily life. But what the word righteousness means, according to the Strong's Concordance, it just means equity of character or act. And what that's saying is it is talking about a purity, a wholeness, either in uh, character that's talking about your very nature, the way that you've been born again, or in your actions. Sometimes you have to use the context of a statement to be able to understand it. But in layman's terms, what this means is, the way I interpret it often is, that righteousness is just talking about right standing with God, being right with God. That's a very layman's term. You might be able to get more technical than that. But basically, that's what he's talking about. And, you know, this is what turned my life around. I was raised in a Christian home. I got born again when I was eight years old, and I was taught the gospel, and so I really did make a real commitment of my life to the Lord at the age of eight. And I was made fun of in the third grade for being a Christian. I mean, there was a change in my life. Even though I hadn't lived a very simple life, there was a noticeable change in my life that caused my friends to ask me the day after I made that decision what happened to me. So the point I'm making is I had a genuine conversion. And I started speaking the Lord. But you know, the problem was that I fell into a trap that I believe most Christians today. And that is that even though I got born again by trusting Jesus and putting my faith in Him, I fell into the deception of trusting that God was going to accept me after my salvation. You know, on a day-to-day basis, as far as His relationship, His pleasure with me, I felt that God's pleasure for me was proportional to my actions. And so I got to looking at my righteousness, at the things that I did. And I believe that God loved me according to how well I lived. And you know, as a young kid, I actually was under the deception of thinking that I could live this. And I mean, I lived holier than most people have. I've never used the word of profanity in all my life. I've never taken a drink of liquor in all of my life. I've never smoked a cigarette in all of my life. And I've never eaten food coffee in all of my life. And I know that when I say that in my meetings, sometimes you hear this gas. People say, coffee? What are you saying? Coffee and food are the same thing? No, I'm just saying that, man, I was living a holy life. There's actually a scripture that you can stand with for drinking coffee. Out of Mark chapter 16, verse 18, it says you can drink any deadly thing that shall not harm you. But the point I'm making is, man, I was living a holy life. And I really was trying to do everything that was told me. Matter of fact, I remember when I was a kid. I actually went to the pastor one time and asked what sin was, because they said that you sinned every day. And yet, I'm, I wasn't doing any of the things that they said. I never went dancing, because that was all sin in the Baptist denomination. They even called them mixed babies, and boys and girls swam together in a public uh, swimming pool. And we didn't do that. That was against our religion. And so, man, I never did any of that. Stuff. I did something I wasn't really real old in that area, but... Uh, According to their standards. But I'm saying as a general rule, I didn't uh, even do that. I mean, I was just doing everything they said, and yet they were still telling me I sin every day. So I remember going to the pastor and asking him, well, if I sin every day, what is it? And he listed off drinking, cussing, smoking, dipping, chewing, going with those who do. And I didn't do any of those kind of things. And yet he was still telling me I sin. So I said, well, I need to know what it is. And honestly, I was doing what the Said. And finally, I remember he used Romans 14, 23, whatsoever is not a faith, it's sin. And I used that uh, growing up, that basically anything that I didn't just feel pleased God, if there was any reservation, if there was a question about it, I just didn't do it. And I mean, there's a lot of things I didn't do that I probably could have well done, but you know, my conscience, basically I just let my conscience be my guide. And the point I'm making through all this, I'm not trying to promote or maintain my holiness, but I'm saying that I really gave it a run for the money. I did everything I was told, and yet I had no confidence that I was in right standing with God. I didn't use the term right necessarily when I was young, 
But I didn't feel that God was pleased with me. I didn't feel that I was right. I didn't feel that I was right with God. And you know, most people, most people listen to this thing don't feel that way either. Now, in uh, principle, I know that, you know, if you were in church, and if I was asking a question, how many of you believe that you're righteous? There's people that would raise their hand because they've heard some scriptures that talk about you being righteous. But in actuality, most of us don't have that confidence and security and boldness that comes from knowing that we, God is really pleased with us. And if I had time, I, I really want to get into these scriptures. I'm headed in that direction. But I was using this as testimony to get into it. And so that if I had time, I could just show you that every problem we have, insecurity, fear, worry, all of those kind of things, actually are a byproduct of not knowing if you are in right with For instance, the subject is depression. Did you know that if you really understood how much God loves you and how right and how holy you are and how God is pleased with you, it would be impossible to be depressed. And I know that there's people listening to me think, oh, no, I, my depression has nothing to do with my relationship with God. But you don't understand. I've got this sickness, and the doctor told me I'm going to die. Well, again, if you really understood your right standing with God, how much God loves you, what God has prepared for you, you well, then you'd either be one of two things. You'd either get healed because you had your mind so stayed upon God, and the Scripture talks about that that's health unto you. Or, if you went ahead and died, man, you'd be right in the presence of God. And instead of being depressed and discouraged, you could actually get to rejoicing when they tell you that you're going to die. Again, I know that some people think that that's extreme, but if you followed it out, if you really understood you're right standing with God, you'd find out that depression, fear of death, worry about what people think about you, wouldn't that? Who cares what somebody else thinks about you if God Almighty likes you? I mean, if God Almighty is pleased with you, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, loves you, then who gives a rip about Mr. or Mrs. Nobody that rejects you? I mean, if you really put it into its proper context, understanding God's love for you, your right standing with God, would literally solve every problem that you've got. And so this is what I experienced. I tried to live holy, and then I had a miraculous encounter with God who showed me that he has forgiven me and cleansed me. It changed my life around, and yet it took me a long time for my head to catch up with what I experienced. And so the things that I'm sharing with you on these days are based on my own personal experience. This is what changed my life, was learning that God loved me, and I was right with him and accepted with God, not based on something that I did, but just based on his goodness. It was a free gift to me. This transformed my life, and I really believe that if you can get hold of the things that I'll be teaching on this three-tape series, this will change your life. On this tape, I'll be talking about how to, what is righteousness and about how do you obtain it. And then after we make that point, the second tape is going to go into... Uh, All right, I see this with the fact in Scripture, but how can I understand a holy God looking at me and counting me righteous and right standing when I see myself so wrong? Uh, we're going to answer that, I promise you. That's going to be a life you can continue. And then in the third case, I'm actually going to get into talking about, is there a place for condemnation? If you really understand the point I make on the first three cases about how God views you being righteous, and how it's legal for God to see you that way. But if you move over to start seeing yourself as a righteous person, then the next thing is that if that mean that you know you're just free to do anything, uh, what happens when you do something wrong? Is there a place to see it rotten and condemned? And you know what? I'm going to share some things with you that may startle you, but I believe it'll fit perfectly in the truth of unrighteousness. So I think it'll be really, really good for you. Let me start by saying that there are 500 and some verses in the Bible that use the word righteousness or righteous. And it's actually 540 times those verses in those 520 verses. And just contrast this with the word faith, faithfulness, faithful. You know, when we talk about faith, it's the way it says about faith, it's impossible to please God. And yet, faith, all of these words concerning faith are only used 348 In other words, there's about one and a half times as many mentions of righteousness in the Bible as there is concerning faith. 
Ale wiara jest ważna, ponieważ jest sposobem. for their seats in the God, the writer, he's talking about they were doing it all wrong. They had the wrong understanding. When people were jealous. Man, they wanted to be in right standing with God. They prayed three times a day. We were trusted on this. Street in front of them to draw people's attention. They paid tithes of mint and anise and cumin and on and on and on it went. I mean, these people were very jealous, very religious. And yet he's telling them that these people who weren't even thinking righteous have become more righteous in the sight of God than the religious. You know, this just really rubs the Jews the wrong way, and it really rubs people wrong today, too. So sometimes it's the hardest, the foxes, the uh, sinners out there are actually more accepted to God than the religious folks. Now, that's not the way to say that. Verse 31 says, but Israel, which is talking about the church or the religious people, which follows after the law of righteousness has not obtained the law of righteousness. Therefore, uh, verse why? why is this so? Why is it that somebody who wasn't even thinking after God but could become more acceptable to God than the person who wanted to in all these religious acts? Verse 32 says, Because they sought it not by faith, but as it was by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, and rock of offense, and whosoever is in the stone shall not be ashamed. So what I'm saying is, there are two types of righteousness. There's a righteousness that is produced by your own effort, your own works, and that's what religious people are asking. Religious people, basically, here is the concept that religion teaches to us. Religion teaches that if you are living right and doing right and keeping all of these rules and regulations, then God will accept you based on your performance. And that's what Paul here is equating to the nation of Israel, the way they thought. And he said that because that's the way they were trying to obtain right things for you, was not sinful. Through their own actions, their own good works. Therefore, they had fallen short. And yet the people who weren't seeking to please God by their actions had obtained to the righteousness, the true righteousness of God, because they sought it by faith. In other words, they didn't receive righteousness as a gift. They didn't want it. Go down in chapter 10. It says, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Lord is in the 10th 
for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to God. And here's the thing that we the word for you. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not committed themselves unto the righteousness of God. Well, that is the And that shows you there is a God's righteousness. There is a righteousness of God, a righteousness that comes from God. And if you're ignorant of a righteousness that comes from God, that is, that is just a gift that is given unto you, then you will try and establish your own righteousness or self-righteousness. And if you're doing that, you cannot submit yourself unto the righteousness of God. In other words, you cannot be trusted in your self-righteousness, the righteousness that you produce by your own works, your own works. And trusting in the righteousness of God is coming as a free gift. You can't be doing both of those at the same time. It's either one or the other. A scripture, if you're here in Romans chapter uh, 10, just one more chapter over, Romans chapter 11, verse 6 says, And if by grace, he's talking about, again, the nice if it comes by grace, then it is no more work. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of work, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. And that's just all in English. The saying that it's one or the other. It's not a combination of the two. You're either justified, saved by grace, without work. Otherwise, it's not pure grace. It's not true grace. Grace, if you mix work with it, or you're either saved by what you do, by your own effort, without the grace of God, otherwise, it's not true works, if you mix it half and half. Religion today has to acknowledge that, yes, it takes the grace of God, nobody's good enough to save themselves, but they believe it. And this is what Paul talked about in Galatians chapter 1. He says that it's not a total disproof that people are perfect, but it's a perversion of the gospel. He said they have perverted it, saying, well, yes, you need the grace of God, but you also have to live holy on your own. It's a combination of the two. Yeah. And right here, he says, no, it's not so. And in Galatians uh, chapter 1, he says that if anybody, even an angel, preaches another gospel and he first what I've said, then let him be heard. And then he repeats it. He a strong statement. He said it again, that if any man preaches any other gospel unto you, then that's not true. Let him be a Christian. So we find here in these passages of Scripture that there's actually two types of righteousness. One is the righteous nature that actually comes as a gift from God. As a matter of fact, if you just kept reading on in Romans chapter 10 and verse 4, it says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Every one of now, this is an awesome statement, and I haven't got time to really speak on this, but you know what? Most people really believe that we still have to keep the law today to be in right standing with God for God to be pleased with us. In other words, you could say that most people believe that righteousness still is dependent upon us keeping the law. And this scripture says Christ is the end of the law for righteousness for everyone that believes. Well, that flies in the face of what most people really believe today. Verse 5, for Moses described the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. In other words, what he's saying is if you're trying to be in right standing with God through your own performance, <laughs> <and> your <laughs> you do, then you have to keep all of those precepts of the law. And this is the point that most people miss. Uh, Galatians chapter 3 makes this point very clearly that it's not just keeping parts of it, but you have to keep all of the law. Let me just read that passage to you. Out of Galatians chapter 3, and in verse 10, it says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Notice it says, All things. See, some people who preach that, yes, you've got to keep the law and you've got to do certain things before you can be in right standing with God. They. Very seldom. I've never heard anybody say that you have to be perfect. They just say you have to live as holy as you can, and if you fall short, you have to ask God to forgive you. But that's not what the law says. The law says you have to keep all of the things that are written in the book of the law to do that. That's, the law only keeps that you do the best you can, and, and in fact, you have to do it. If you make 70 or above, then you pass, and if you make below that, then you're rejected by God. Well, the scripture teaches that you have to do them all. 
in James chapter 2, verse 10, it says that whosoever keeps the whole law and yet offends at one point becomes guilty of everything. What a radical thing. Again, that's very too clear. You need to get hold of that. It says that if you keep the whole law and yet become guilty in one point, you've broken all of the law. See, the law more accurately is described like a huge glass window. And it wouldn't matter if you threw a BB through, or shot a BB through the window, or if you ran a truck through the window. If you break it, the inside frame is broken and it has to be replaced. God's law is God's law is that that nobody, nobody, nobody can ever keep the law. Let me show you a passage out of Deuteronomy chapter 28, and this one is often quoted by people and used to promote uh, a self-righteous, living, free, and holy of sin so that you can be accepted with God. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1 says, And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on thee, and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. And then in verse, all the way down through verse 14, it lists the blessings that will come upon thee for keeping the law. Then in verses 15 through 68, it lists all the curses that come upon you if you don't keep the law. Now, if you're much of a mathematician, you'll know that there's more verses in verses 15 through 68 than there are in verses 3 through 14. In other words, the curses are a lot more detailed and numerous than the blessings. And you know what? I've heard people take this and say, well, boy, that's what you got to do. you got to hearken diligently, and you got to serve the Lord and do as much as you can. If you've been praying 30 minutes a day, pray an hour a day. If you read the Bible, you know, for one hour a day, read it two hours a day. You've got to be holy and do this. But go back and just look closely at what these verses say. This says, You shall hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and do all his commandments. All. A L L. You know what that means in the Greek? It means all. It means that you can't miss all of them. As a matter of fact, if you back up just one verse in the 27th chapter, it's uh, in the 27th chapter, the children of Israel were coming into the land of uh, the promised land. Uh, Moses told them to put half of the people on Mount Gerizim and half of the people on Mount Ebal. And one half of those people would pronounce the blessings. The other half would pronounce the curses that come upon you if you don't obey. And so it lifted all of these curses, and that's what the 27th chapter is doing. Cursed are you if you, if you, uh, you know, set light by your father or mother. Cursed if you remove your neighbor's landmark. Cursed are you if you make the blind to wander out of the way. Cursed if you pervert the judgment of a stranger. Cursed are you if you lie with your father's wife, any type of sexual sin. And it goes on and it just said, Cursed are you, cursed are you if you do this, if you do that. And then the last verse says, Cursed be ye that confirmeth not all. There's that word again. All the words of this law to do them, and the people shall say, Amen. In other words, the law, nobody could ever keep it. The only person who ever kept the law was the Lord Jesus Christ. He was righteous by nature because he was God, but then he came out and became righteous in action also and earned the righteousness that came by the law. And according to Romans chapter 8, verse 4, now the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Through Jesus, we have had him just give us right things, righteousness, equity of character, and which God is not through what we have done, but through a gift from God. And that's what Jesus is saying. See, the people who preach that you become in right standing with God by what you do, those people do not really promote that you have to be perfect, but rather do the best you can, and if you do, uh, it's okay. But that's not what the law says. I tell you, it's amazing how religion has taken the condemnation and the guilt that came through the law 
You know, if you really stop and thought about that, that is an awesome passage of Scripture. And I can promise you that whoever you are, if you're breathing today, your righteousness does not exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. Now, I need to qualify that. I, it, your self-righteousness doesn't exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. Your actions, your actions, you aren't living it holy as they live. You are not fulfilling the law as well as they fulfill it. And some of you may think, oh, you don't know me. Well, you probably don't know the Pharisees. I mean, they live a pure, separated life. And yet Jesus said you had to have something more than that. Now, that isn't saying that you have to go out and try even harder and you have to wear all their garments and go through the rituals. But the point I'm making is that the righteousness that comes by faith, that we started out reading about in Romans chapter 9, that righteousness is better than self-righteousness. The righteousness that you receive as a gift when you just make Jesus your Lord, that righteousness makes you, it, it gives you God's righteousness. It's actually His power. You know, I'm here in Philippians chapter 3, so let me just turn back real quick. Right back to Philippians 3. But let me turn back to Romans chapter 10, and in verse 6 it says, But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this life, say not in thine heart. Who shall ascend into heaven? What he's doing, he's talking about how is it to obtain righteousness? What is true righteousness? How does it feel? He's saying it, it doesn't say who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. You know what this is talking about? Who shall ascend into heaven? That's talking about how holy do you have to be? Do you have to be so holy that man, you could ascend into heaven through your own effort? Well, no, because see, Jesus came down to earth for us. You don't have to work your way to heaven. Jesus came down to earth, and he, he lived holy for you. Or, the next thing is, who shall descend into the sea? That is, to bring up Christ again from the dead. See, some people believe they have to live so holy that basically they can enter into heaven on their own goodness, and that's denying what Jesus did for us. But then other people believe that you have to beat yourself and hate yourself and just... Uh, you know, put yourself through terrible repentance and all of these things. There are some groups that I've actually talked to a man one time that in South America, he uh, was crucified on a cross during the Lent season and went through that. He actually crawled three miles over broken glass and he took his uh, shirt, uh, sleeve, rolled them up and showed them the scars on his uh, elbows and on his forearms and on his knees where he'd crawled over broken glass and fled to do penance. See, there's some people that believe you have to do these kind of things to atone for your sins. But that's denying that Christ has already atoned for your sins. He died for you. He literally went to hell. He suffered the judgment of God, and he has paid for your sins. So true righteousness doesn't say that you have to live holy enough that you can ascend into heaven. Christ already did that for you. It doesn't say that you have to do penance and beat yourself and hate yourself. Christ has already borne your sin for you. But what does it say? It says, the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. The way you obtain right standing with God, the Bible right standing with God, is not through your acts of righteousness, through the things that you do, but you believe for it. You confess Jesus as your Lord. You receive His salvation, and you believe unto salvation, is what this is saying. Praise God. Oh, that is so powerful. Back in Philippians chapter 3, here's what Paul is saying. He says in verse 6, concerning zeal, he persecuted the church. Now, from the Jewish perspective, I mean, this was a very noble thing to do. They looked at Jesus as being awesome of uh, uh, Judaism. It was going to pervert it and turn people away from keeping the law and, and this self-righteousness that comes through adherence to the law. So he persecuted the church mercilessly. You can read about that in the book of Acts, chapter 7, 8, and 9. And Paul was the one that hailed people in and put them in prison and even put some people to death. I mean, he was zealous persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law. Notice it qualifies this. He wasn't saying he was righteous, but he says, according to the righteousness which came by the law, 
The righteousness that is taught by the religious leaders, living holy, and adhering to standards. He said he was blameless. He didn't say he was sinless, but he was blameless. In other words, he did it as much as humanly possible. And any mistakes or any failures that he could was just because he was a person, not because he didn't try. He had every bit of effort and zeal that it took to keep the it took to keep the law. He just uh, he failed to do things perfectly, but he certainly was blameless. Blameless. In verse seven, he says, "But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost." You know, lots of times, lots of us pray we take this passage of Scripture, and we talk about how we have to count all of our past works and sins and failures and things like this. We just need to put them behind us and go on. And that's the truth. But Paul wasn't talking about failures. He wasn't talking about bad things. He was talking about all of his accomplishments. He was talking about all of his degrees. You know, in a sense, Paul had been through school. He went through the school of Gamaliel in Jerusalem, and Paul was the most educated person that he would have had a doctorate in everything that there was to have a doctorate in. And Paul was saying that all of his doctrinal degrees, all of his diplomas, he counted them but done for the sake of the Lord. In other words, he wasn't just counting all of his failures, turning from them, but he was turning from all of his great accomplishments. In the next verse, Gabe Dallas, I count all things but lost. For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, to whom I suffer the loss of all things and to count them but dumb, that I may win Christ. You know, it's amazing here. Most people don't really think on this, but Paul chose a very descriptive word here when he says he counts all of his accomplishments like dumb. You know what dung is? Uh, I hope I don't have to go into a lot of detail for this, but you need to think about this. I mean, you don't carry dung around with you. You don't carry... Wiary w Chrystusa, sprawiedliwość z Boga. Excrement around with you and put it on your wall and frame it and brag about it and talk about it and, and show everybody this thing. But man, you get it away from you. You burn it. You flush it. Well, Paul, that's what he was talking about. That's the worst that he put on all his way. Did you know that there's a lot of people that don't look at themselves that way today? They say that, well, I'm really a good person and I only need a little help from Jesus. I only need it a little bit. I'm not like this old publican over here. See, that's what happened uh, in the parable that Jesus taught about the Pharisee and the publican that went to pray. And the Pharisee, he stood up and shouted loud and was proud. said, I thank you, Father. I'm not like other men. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of this man if you to And I do all of these kind of things. I thank you I'm not like this old publican over here. With the publican in that day, he says, I think yeah, I'm not like him. But the old publican over there, the tax collector, he bowed himself. He couldn't even look up. He knew he was so unworthy. And he peed upon his breath and said, God be merciful unto me, a sinner. And Jesus said that the publican is the one that God has on the one that God has on the one not the Pharisee. The Pharisee was living a holier life, but see, he was trusting in his holiness. And the truth is, it doesn't matter how holy you live, 
you are going to fall short of God's standard of holiness. See, this is where I, I was. I was living a super holy life, but I had come under the deception of thinking that God was going to love me, accept me, and relate to me based on how well I live. And even though I was living better than most, I still wasn't enjoying the presence and the blessings of God because my faith was in me. Faith was in me. And I never was good enough. I mean, I tried harder than most, and I never was good enough. And see, the publican, he just smote his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's the kind of person that God just gives righteousness to. A righteousness which is not of the law, but a righteousness which is of God. The righteousness of God that Romans chapter 10 talks about. And this is what Paul is saying. He recognized that there was a right standing with God that came not based on performance, but it came as a gift from God. And he recognized that that righteousness was greater in quantity and quality than he could ever produce on his own. And I mean, Paul was a very righteous person concerning the righteousness of which was in the law. He was blameless. But he recognized his righteousness was infinitely short of what God offered. And so he counted everything he had done, all of his great works, his holiness, his goodness. He just totally renounced all that and turned from it. And he put faith in the Lord. He counted everything that he had done as dumb compared to what Christ had done. And in the verse, uh, next verse it says, verse 9, And he, he wanted to be found in him, in Christ, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Man, that's a mouthful. He forgot everything that he had done. He quit putting faith in himself. He quit trusting in his own goodness as the basis of God loving him. And he wanted to be found in Christ, not having his own righteousness, a self-righteousness, which is of the law, based on his adherence to rules and regulations, but a righteousness which is through the faith of Christ. Notice he didn't say faith in Christ. But this is literally the faith of God. It's the faith of God that makes us righteous. You know, there's a, a parallel passage of Scripture to this in Galatians chapter 2. Where Paul said in verse 20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Not faith in the Son of God, but I'm living by the faith of the Son of God. You know, I can teach on this for hours, but most people don't understand that we aren't trying to live for God. But true Christianity is God living through us. It's not us trying to live better than we did before we made Jesus our Lord. But when we make Jesus our Lord, the true Christian life is learning how to get out of our way and quit trusting in ourselves and quit trying to love people. You know, just white knuckles saying, the name of Jesus, I will love you, and you just have willpower. No, that's not true. But true Christianity is saying, God, I recognize that I can't, I can't love this person. It's beyond my human ability to turn the other cheek when this person is hit me. And they fit my face. It's beyond human ability to just walk, wipe it off and continue to walk in love with them. And so what you do is say, God, I can't do it. I call on you. And you humble yourself and you ask God for help. And man, he just supernatural. He gives you supernatural ability to live the Christian life. The Christian life isn't hard to live. It's impossible to live. It is humanly impossible to measure up to all of the standards of Christianity. And the only way that we can ever be successful is to quit living it out of human ability, human righteousness, self-righteousness, and we have to just let God literally live through us. So he said, the life that I'm now living, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Verse 21, this place is 221. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Man, what a powerful thing. If righteousness 
comes through the law. If righteousness comes by me keeping some standard, and if I do well at it, then God counts me righteous. If that's the way that it comes, then Christ is dead in vain. Man, what a strong statement. Did you know you can actually void the work of Christ in your life? If you are trusting in your own self-righteousness as the basis of God loving you. Boy, that's a radical statement. Somebody says, how could that be? Somebody says, how could that be? The reason that Christ came and died for you is so that you wouldn't have to live up to some standard. You wouldn't have to be holy. Instead, you just receive it as a gift. Now, I know somebody thinking, man, well, you're advocating them that you just live like the devil and still be right. No, if you listen to the entire tape theory, all the interest of that might show you why it's important for you to live righteous. But it's not important for you to act right in order to be right in the sight of God. The only thing you have to do is believe right, not act right. If you believe right, then God will make you right. And if you are trusting in what you do, and if that's where your faith is and looking at yourself, then you just basically make the death of Christ in vain for you. It has no impact on you. I know some of you are thinking, brother, that's not so. How did you say that? Well, look over here in Galatians chapter 5. Same book. Paul is writing and he says in verse 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. If I had time to put it in the context, this yoke of bondage is talking about the law. The law is a yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ will profit. you nothing. Now, we just read in Philippians chapter 3, verse 6, that Paul was circumcised. So he's not saying that you he's not circumcised. The application of this today is he's not saying that you should do the right thing. See, Paul himself was satisfied, but he wasn't trusting in the fact that he was trusting. And that word wasn't where his faith was. Yes, we should do right things today, but you can't trust in your observance of doing right things as being the thing that makes you righteous. And if you do trust in your own righteousness, then Christ shall talk to you nothing, is what this says. Man, that's exactly where a lot of people are today. And let me also make this point, that you can be born again by putting faith in Jesus for your initial born again salvation. Most of the time when people preach the gospel today, they sing a song, you know, just as I am, without one plea. But when it comes to the eternal salvation, people trust that that is totally by the right of God. And, uh, even though you aren't living holy, you trust that God will accept you because you put faith in you. Then, when it comes to the daily relationship with the Lord, maintenance of our relationship with God over a prolonged period of time, we fall back into thinking that God wants us to love us based on our performance. You couldn't have gotten saved that way, and you can't continue to relate to the Lord that way. As a matter of fact, look right here in Galatians again, chapter 3. And in Galatians chapter 3, and verse 1, Paul said, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? This word foolish in the Greek literally means you. I mean, that's just what it means. That's what Paul said. I mean, it's stupid to say that. And then when it says, who hath bewitched you? This is talking about demonic deception. I mean, these people were under a demonic curse. He says that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth crucified among you. It's only what I learned of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Well, the way that they received the Spirit wasn't through something that they did. It just came. Uh, Paul preached the gospel unto them. They believed it. And he knew that. We asked him this question. The answer is, well, they received it by hearing of faith, not the word of holy. And then verse 3, he says, Are you so foolish? Again, the word could be translated stupid. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? In other words, if the way you got saved is by putting faith in the Savior, you didn't have any righteous acts to offer God. 
I mean, when most people get to work, man, you hadn't been fasting, praying, studying the Word, living holy. And you came to the Lord as an adulterer, as a liar, a thief, a thief, all of these kind of things. You had all of these sins in your life. You hadn't been fasting. You hadn't been praying. You hadn't been paying your tithes. You hadn't been going to church. You hadn't been doing anything. And yet you called on Jesus to save you, and you received the greatest miracle that you'll ever receive, which is salvation. And then we get so foolish that we started off totally dependent upon God, saying, just as I am. But now, that's not enough. We have not enough. We have to live holy unless we're reading the Bible, unless we're going to church and paying our tithes and praying an hour a day and doing this and doing that. God will answer our prayers. That's not what the Scripture says. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. That means the same way you got born again is the same way that you're supposed to continue to relate to the Lord. And you do it not based on what you do. When you came to the Lord, you didn't offer your holiness to God and say, God, look how holy I have been. Now save me. No, you looked to Jesus and said, look what Jesus did. I receive it. I believe I'm saved through him. That's the way you're supposed to still be relating to the Lord, is what all of these passages of Scripture say. Are you so foolish having begun in the Spirit? Are you now made perfect in the flesh? Well, I tell you, that's descriptive of a lot of people today, and that is not the way that God intended it to be. So let's go back to Galatians chapter 5. In verse 2, he says, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall promise you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. This is the same point that I made over there in Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. Cursed is he that continueth not in all things that are written in the law to do it. If you are going to trust to be justified, and the word justified, here's a little layman's definition. It means just as if I had never sinned. Justified. Never sinned. And if you are going to be just as if you've never sinned, then you have to do it through faith and not through performance. Nobody, based on their performance, will ever be good enough to have God say, All right, I owe you salvation. You earned it. No, we all have to come as the public and just say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And that's not only when you get born again, but every day of your born again life, you still have to trust in the mercy of God. In verse 4, it says, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. And he's talking to Christians here. This is not talking about that they've lost their salvation. That's not what this is talking about. It just means that they are no longer living under the grace of God. They aren't having God's ability available to them on an unearned, undeserved basis. But instead, they're getting only what they deserve. Man, you don't want what you deserve. You may think you do, but you don't. Amen. I used to develop pictures in a photography studio. And we'd have these people come in, usually as women, and they'd say something like, Oh, this picture doesn't do you. And, you know, I never had the nerve to say it, but I thought it a lot. I always wanted to say, Lady, you don't need justice. You need mercy. And you know what? That's the way it is with us. Some people say, well, I'm believing that God's going to move in my life because I've fasted, because I've prayed, and because you've done these things. But the truth is, you don't want what you deserve. Even after you're born again, if God gave you what you deserve, you would go directly to hell. That's true. I mean, the best of us, at your very best, on your very best day, you are infinitely lower than God's standard of perfection. And God says you either have to get what you deserve or you have to humble yourself and receive it as a free gift. Look over here in Romans chapter 3. This is basically the point that he's making in Romans chapter 3. Verse 19, it says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. You know the purpose of the law wasn't so that you could keep all of the commandments. And if you would keep them well enough, God would accept you and you would become righteous. The law was not given for righteousness. Remember, Romans 10, 4, it says, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. The law wasn't given so that you could obtain righteousness, but rather the law was given to show you how incapable 
of being in right standing with God you were through your own actions, and it was to make you turn from self-righteousness and receive faith righteousness. A righteousness that comes by faith. Of my works. I've got a tape entitled The Purpose of the Law that will explain that, or a three tape series entitled The Nature of God. I've also got a book on that entitled The Nature of God that will explain this. God basically saw that man was trusting in himself and in his own goodness and becoming self righteous, putting all of the emphasis on I've got to be good enough, and he wasn't just accepting the goodness of God that made him in right standing with God. And so God said, I've got to take away this deception. And the way he did it was to give the commandments. Not only ten commandments, but he gave hundreds of thousands of commandments that nobody could ever keep. Nobody ever kept them. You know, in the tenth chapter of the book of Mark, there was a rich young ruler that came to Jesus and he said, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, see, Jesus didn't come teaching you to do certain laws and commandments. That was not the message of Jesus. The message of Jesus was to take in the woman in the very was to take the woman in, taken in the very act of adultery and just pronounce her free and extend mercy and forgiveness to her. All she had to do was humble herself and receive it. He, he came to the publicans and he chose a publican to be one of his disciples and to follow him. Jesus offered people right standing with God, not through holy living, but rather through just humbling themselves and receiving it as a gift. So Jesus didn't preach, you must do this, this, and this. That was the message of the religion of Jesus' day. And so this young, rich young ruler, he came asking Jesus for something that Jesus wasn't telling other people. But see, this man wanted to know what he had to do. So Jesus used the law the way that it was intended to be used for him. He says, you know the law, thou shalt not kill, you shall not steal, you shall not commit a murder, and you shall not do all of these things. And this religious, rich, young ruler, like so many people today, is under the deception that he could actually do all of the law and keep all of the law. And he says, all of these things have I kept since my youth up. And Jesus, it says in Mark chapter 10, I forget the exact verse, but it says, Jesus beholding him loved him. And then he told him, he says, go, sell whatever you have and give it to the poor and come and follow me. And the man went away grieving because he had great riches and he didn't do what Jesus told him to do. The scripture says that Jesus told him this because he loved him. Jesus didn't tell him this to get rid of him, to be hard on him. You know what he was doing? This man was under the deception of thinking that he actually was good enough. He had kept all of the laws and so therefore God had to accept him. Well, that would send him to hell. That kind of attitude would keep him out of heaven because he had never humbled himself and received faith righteousness, a righteousness that comes by faith. He was trying to maintain self-righteousness. And so the Lord needed to bring him out of that deception. So what did he do? He told him to go sell whatever he had. You know, Jesus didn't tell every rich man that. Zacchaeus was also a rich man. He was a publican, a tax collector, and he had stole most of his money. Jesus went and ate in his home, and he didn't mention one thing to Zacchaeus about selling everything he had. He didn't have to, because Zacchaeus knew he was a sinner. He humbled himself. He wasn't proclaiming and trusting his own righteousness, and so he just humbled himself and received the salvation and willfully started giving things away. So Jesus didn't tell every rich man to sell his money, but he told this rich young ruler to do it. You know why? Because this rich young ruler thought he had kept all of the commandments. You know what the first commandment in the Bible in Exodus chapter 20 is? The very first of the Ten Commandments says that he shall have no other gods before me. That was the very first commandment. And by Jesus telling this rich young ruler to go set everything that he had. You know what he was doing? He was showing him that he had broken the first commandment, that this rich young ruler's money was his God. 
what that money could purchase for him and do was more important to him than right standing with God. And when it came to giving up what he had, what he had for his own effort, he trusted in himself more than he trusted in God. Jesus was showing him that he broke the very first commandment. And you know, when Jesus came along in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, Jesus gave a lot of the Old Testament commandments. And he said, you've heard that in the law it says that you shall not commit adultery. But I say unto you that if you even look on a woman and lust at her in your heart, you've already committed adultery in your heart. Is Jesus changing the commandment? Changing the commandment? No, he was just showing that the commandment actually was even more severe than what people had thought. It's not just a matter of keeping your zipper up and not uh, violating things with other people. It's in your heart. You can't even think that. And if you thought it, you actually are guilty of it in your heart. Jesus said that some people have said you shall not murder. But I say unto you that if you hate your brother without being provoked, you've already committed murder in your heart. So see, Jesus, if you look at things from the Lord's standpoint, nobody, nobody but nobody that's ever breathed on the face of the earth has ever been able to keep all of these commandments and laws. Why did God give such strict laws? It's not because he hates you. It's because he wanted to give righteousness, right standing with him as a gift. And people were wrong in making the mistake of thinking that they could earn it. And so he had to remove this deception. And so he just gave the law for what purpose? Well, this verse, Romans 3.19, says, So that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. In verse 20, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest. Man, if you can read, if you can listen, hear, if you believe what I'm saying, this ought to forever end trying to earn God's favor by performance. It says the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. In other words, the Old Testament law isn't against what I'm saying. It wasn't that under the Old Testament God gave righteousness by keeping the law, and under the New Testament He gives a faith righteousness that comes as a gift. No, the Old Testament law never was for the purpose of making you righteous. It was just to show you your needs. And even the Old Testament law prophesied and told about the coming Messiah. Every sacrifice of an Old Testament animal was a picture and a type of a Messiah coming who would bear our sins. When the priests sacrificed those animals, they would lay their hands on the head of the animal, and then they would lean on the animal and confess the sins of the people. They would actually put their weight on that animal. That was symbolic of our sins that were being confessed out of their mouth, actually coming upon that animal, and then the animal was killed to suffer the judgment that rightfully belonged to us. That was a picture. It was a type of a Savior who would come and bear our sins for us. And that's exactly what 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says. It says, For he made me, talking about God the Father, made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God put our sin upon Jesus, and Jesus bore our sins so that we could receive. His righteousness. We didn't receive just a little bit of it. We have been made the righteousness of God. You see, the Old Testament law even prophesied all of this. In verse 21, it says, Now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, upon all, or excuse me, unto all, and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. That is awesome. It says it's the righteousness of God. These people who are preaching that you've got to be holy 
They're preaching a self-righteousness. That I guarantee you, regardless of how holy you are, you may look good compared to some person. But all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's verse 23. And so, see, it doesn't. God isn't judging you based on a relative worth compared to other people. The standard that God uses is Jesus. It's just like, you know, if uh, you had a measuring stick and you wanted to see how tall a person is and there was a certain height that was considered to be holy, well, you might compare yourself to other people and you might stand up with somebody and compared to other people, you're about normal. And so you feel real good about yourself. But then Jesus comes along, who stands heads and comes along, who stands heads and shoulders above anybody else. And that's the measuring stick that God used. Nobody could ever measure up to Jesus. So see, now God gives a righteousness. It's not just human righteousness. It's the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe that there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now we take verse 23 out of context often and say that all of sin comes short of the glory of God. And we use that to prove universal guilt. And that's the true statement. But you know the point that is really being made in verse 24. So let me read verse 23 and 24 together. It says, For all of sin and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. In other words, it's basically saying since all are guilty and nobody can stand before God based on your own goodness, then you don't have to worry about performing and earning the favor of God because in the same way as all are guilty, all have also become justified through Christ Jesus. And it's understood. It's all those who put their faith in Jesus. If you will receive it, everyone can be justified through the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 25. It says, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, that means an atoning sacrifice, through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. For that time. God declares God, Jesus' righteousness to our account. There is no way that you could ever match the righteousness, the holiness, the purity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those of you who think that maybe you've got to be right, in your actions for God to love you. You may be better than I am, but who wants to be the best sinner that ever got sent to hell? The truth is, all of us have sinned and come short, and the only thing that's ever going to make you in right standing with God is not a self-righteousness based on action, but it's going to have to be the righteousness of Jesus. It says that he, he declares his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through four bears. And then he repeats it in the next verse. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Man, that is so awesome. God makes us righteous not through what we do, but when we put faith in Jesus, we literally receive the righteousness of God. We get Jesus' righteousness put to our account. I am as holy. Dla okazania sprawiedliwości ta się i usprawiedliwiającym as righteous and as pure as Jesus is. And I know some of you may choke on that and think, how can you say that? Because you're looking on my physical body. You look on the external. But the Bible says in 1 Samuel 16, 7, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. And in my heart, I have a new nature. I am born again. And Jesus' righteousness has been imputed unto me. It's placed on the inside. And I'm righteous in the sight of God, not because I act righteous, but because I am righteous. I am a human being, not a human doing. What I mean by that is I am righteous. That's my nature. And my actions flow out of that. But most people think that we are human doings. It's all what we do that make us who we are. No, that's not so. You have a nature. When you get born again, God gives you a righteous nature. And then holiness is a fruit 
and not a root of salvation. Holiness is a byproduct of relationship with the Lord, not a way to relationship with the Lord. Verse 27, Romans 3, 27, where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law of works made by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Again, if you can read, I don't know how anybody can persist in thinking that you have to be holy for God to love you. Because this says that you are justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Oh, what a strong statement. You know, if a person is proud and going around and saying, look what I've done, boasting of their accomplishments, boasting of their accomplishments, then that's a person that doesn't understand faith righteousness. It's a person that still thinks that God accepts them and makes them right with them based on their actions instead of based on the mercy and the grace of God. And I tell you, you just will never be justified in the sight of God for anything that you've done. Now, this is offensive to religious people who've lived the whole life. You know, the ungodly love this. This is what we started out with in Romans chapter 9. It says that the Gentiles who knew not God and didn't seek after righteousness have obtained them. See, the lost people love this. They to think that I could be accepted with God even though I've blown it, even though I've done everything wrong, even though I'm this terrible sinner. God is just offering me salvation, righteousness as a gift. Boy, the lost people love that. They jump on it like a chicken on a June bug because that's a good thing, amen. But you know what? The righteous people, the self-righteous people, the religious people stumble at this. And this is what it says in the very last verse of Romans chapter 9, that Jesus is a stumbling stone to religious people. Because what it means is that you're telling the person who's denied themselves and lived holy and hasn't gone out with everybody else and gotten drunk and done these things, you're telling that person that they aren't any more loved by God, that it doesn't take any less grace for them to be saved than the person who's living in sin, that everybody needs the same measure of grace. Well, yep, that's exactly what I'm telling them, man. And, I'm say, and you know, that offends religious people. And so, therefore, it's always the religious people that have persecuted the true people who preach the gospel and preach righteousness by faith. It's always been religious people. It was religious people that crucified Jesus. It was religious people that persecuted the early church. Throughout history, persecution always comes through the religious people. Because what it is, they devise these systems of what you've got to do. And the hierarchy of religion uses all of these rules and regulations to manipulate and control people and keep them under their thumb and keep their... money flowing into their coffers. But when you start telling people that, hey, it's not what you do, you don't have to come to church. You don't have to pay your tithes to make God love you. Instead, you ought to come to church because God does love you and because you've already accepted it. You ought to give, not to get God to love you, but because you understand how much God loves you. Just give as you purpose in your heart. That kind of teaching always flies in the face of people who are trying to manipulate and control others. And so, therefore, they persecute the people who preach that because they lose control. That means that these people have to be responsive to God. It has to be a love response rather than a fear response that drives them. And, boy, they hate that. They don't like it. But, you know, the good news about this is that if you understood things properly from God's point of view, Nobody could ever earn right standing with God. It's actually the mercy of God that set this system up this way. Because in man's opinion, we think some people are righteous and holy. But from God's viewpoint, we all sin and come short of the glory of God. And if God would have demanded some level of performance, even if he would have decreased his standards, a 
and made it so that, you know, a lot of people could squeak in. It would have also existed certain people. There's certain people that I mean from the word go. They lived in sin. They were rebellious towards God. And God would have exempted those people. And He would have put even a very minimum requirement that you had to do just the smallest. But because God loved everyone, He wanted a method of salvation that would be available to every person, regardless of what they've done. So, He just said, All right, if you want to trust in yourself, here's what you've got to do. And He gave the law. Not so that people could fulfill it, but rather to make them despair of self-salvation, self-righteousness, and then he turned around and just offered the gift of righteousness, a faith of righteousness, a faith righteousness that comes from God. It's actually his righteousness, and it's exceedingly greater in quality and quantity than what you could ever produce on your own. And if you don't understand that, and if you're just working to try and have God love you, then you'll be frustrated. As it says in Galatians 2.21, you will frustrate the grace of God, and Christ will become of no effect unto you. Now, I'm, most people, when you start talking about righteousness and salvation, they apply it only to being born again. And they think, well, I'm already born again. This doesn't apply to me. But even after you're born again, most people have slipped back into the thing of trying to relate to God based on self-righteousness. And so their, their eternal salvation may be secure, but on a day-to-day basis, they have made Christ of none effect. And they avoided, they made the death of Christ in vain by going back to a self-righteousness. And as I go through this series, on especially the last tape, I'm going to be talking about that there is a place for self-righteousness. Your actions are important, especially in relating to other people. You need to maintain an attitude of holiness, but it doesn't accomplish anything with God because God's standard of holiness is beyond our reach. We're incapable of fulfilling it, and so God just made it a faith righteousness. But there is a place for living holy, and we'll be putting this into uh, so when it comes to relating to God, you need to recognize that every last one of us has sinned and come short of the glory of God. Let me just kind of summarize this and conclude this first take, uh, first take by using an example out of Daniel chapter 5 of the handwriting on the wall is what we commonly refer to this as. 